Now, now joining us at this point is Dr. Thomas Joyner, a distinguished research professor in the Department of Psychology at Florida State University. Now, he's written a book called Why People Die by Suicide. Let me say that again, and there's a picture of it up. Why People Die by Suicide. It's not a beach read, I understand, but it is an important, important message. Now, sadly, Dr. Joyner's own father committed suicide 18 years ago. Now, this really moved you to try to figure out how somebody with such a, a great and productive mind could get in such a dark place as to end their life. That's right. My dad's death makes me feel honor bound to not only understand it, but to exact some revenge for it. Something or somebody stole my dad away from me is the way I view it. And so I feel honor bound to return that favor and exact revenge. Here it's going to be exacting revenge on suicide itself by uh, studying it scientifically, by uh, advocacy, and through clinical and prevention work. Yeah, and so by helping people understand it, know the warning signs, see what's going on, then we're raising awareness just by having this conversation. Absolutely. And that's exactly what these wonderful people are doing down here. Because at this point, you say that Casey really wanted to make a difference in this world, and you can't just now sit back and not do something given the experience, true? Yeah, exactly. I had a lot of the same pain that I think Mr. and Mrs. Brooks expressed, and, and that pain was strong for a while, but it did lessen. And then after it did, I poured my professional energies into trying to combat this international killer. And you've made some headway. You, you figured some thing out. Uh, Dr. Joyner believes that people considering suicide share three traits in, in a very common way. And the first one is feeling like a burden on other people and that their death will be worth more than their life. Talk about that. That's right. It's the idea, the mental calculation that my death will be worth more than my life. If, if you truly believe that, you could see how that would facilitate suicidal behavior and we've shown in multiple studies that it, it does indeed do that crucially the, the person is mistaken in that perception but the, the trick is that they don't know that they're mistaken in that perception they believe it to be true and it spurs suicidal behavior And isn't it true that most suicidal situations and dilemmas that push people over the edge are transient that if they had just stuck it out, they tend to get better? Absolutely. There's, there's no question about that. And, and there's also no question, as you've already alluded to, that there are, are good, effective treatments that work for the conditions that underlie suicidal behavior. Yeah. Psychologically, therapeutically, pharmacologically, there are so many things that can give people relief. Absolutely. The second common trait uh, that Dr. Joyner talks about is a feeling of loneliness or social disconnection. If you look through the literature, the scientific literature on suicidal behavior, arguably the single most powerful risk factor of all is loneliness, a feeling of alienation from others. Yeah, so they just don't feel like they fit, belong, so they're just on the outside looking in, so why not just leave? That's, that's right. All right, and the third thing is, is an interesting thing that he talks about called fearlessness. Uh, regarding pain, injury, and death. People considering suicide have learned to overcome these natural fears, and you say that that's more common than cowardice or that sort of thing. That's right. I think it's a common misunderstanding to think of people who have died by suicide as cowardly or weak. That's just not accurate. And Indeed, to do something as fearsome and as daunting as death by suicide, you do require a kind of fearlessness in order to, to carry through. Yeah. When we come back, uh, we're going to talk about the warning signs that tragically many parents overlooked. I've given you a list of those. We're going to have a little bit of discussion about them when we come back. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline number is a 24-7 toll-free call, and it's there for anyone who feels that this is just getting too real for them. It's just presenting itself and starting to make sense. That number's on the screen now, and if you're in need, don't hesitate to call. You don't have to say who you are. You're not going to be embarrassed. I'm going to call the cops on you and kick your door down. They're going to talk to you. They're going to ask you some questions. There may be going to be a voice of reason when maybe you're not being very reasonable. Now, Dr. Joyner has a new theory for identifying typical uh, suicide personality, and I want to also give you some more 
hopeful points to consider if you're thinking about uh, suicide. Now, this fearlessness thing that, that you talk about, how is that best spotted uh, by a loved one, a family member? What's the best way to recognize it? One is the one involving reckless behavior. Yeah, the high-risk behaviors without regard for their personal safety. Exactly. And then the other is, is the one having to do with trying to access means for self-harm. Someone who's looking for guns or knives or, or poisons, etc. That's, uh, that's a behavior that's usually stopped by this innate fear that we have when somebody's overcome that fear so that they're uh, approaching suicide to that degree, that's a, that's a dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. John, what did you want to say? Well, there were two things that, uh, that you said, Dr. Joyner, that I think were, were probably true for Casey before she died. One was, I think she had a thought in her head of, mom and dad would be better off without me. And number two, nobody will miss me when I die. Right. Right. And the tragedy is that those those are mistaken perceptions, and they just weren't true, but the double tragedy is that Casey did not know that. That's one of, the, one of the things that I want you to think about if this is something that makes sense to you or if you're talking to somebody that's at risk. Suicidal crises are almost always temporary. I mean, if you talk to somebody who thought about it and you're discussing it with them a month later or two months later or later in therapy, they look back and go, oh, you know, that, uh, that seems so profound at the time, and I really can't even remember the details about it now, but at the point it could have resulted in the end of their life. That's right, and, and it does. As you pointed out, 80 to, to 90 times every day in the U.S., we, we lose somebody. Yeah. And if those folks would just have the support and the, and the access to access good mental health care, a, a lot of lives could be saved that way. Another point is that problems are seldom as great as they appear at first glance. That's right. And we found in our research that suicide rates go way down at times of national crisis. They go down, not up, at times of national crisis. And we think it's because the national crisis puts everything into perspective. It puts personal problems into a larger perspective, and people tend not to act on suicidal desires during those times. Now, reasons for living can help sustain a person in pain as well, because as John was saying, it's like, nobody will miss me if I'm gone. It's important that you talk to yourself or others about what role you do play in this world and what contribution you make. And most importantly, doctor, isn't it important to not get isolated, to talk to people about this, friends, church, family, somewhere, to talk about your pain? It's just human nature. We're very, very social creatures. And we just have a basic fundamental need to connect and to belong. And, and to deny that need or to thwart it or not to nurture it usually leads to some sort of negative outcome. Well, Dr. Joyner also has a couple of other things to keep an eye out for. And one of them, you say, is pay attention when someone starts giving away all of their prized possessions. When people are doing things like that, it's not a show. They're not just talking. It's a dangerous warning sign, and, and people need to act on it. But the key is getting the person some help, yes, and it's sir. available. Yes, sir. It's a, it's a problem that needs to be worked through throughout the whole process. We're not talking about days and weeks. We're talking about months and years of, of connecting to vulnerable people and making sure that they have the care that they need and deserve. Yeah. Now, uh, we're going to talk about some of those resources when we come back. We've been talking about a serious subject today, and I know that it's not always easy to think about and talk about, but I've said from the minute I started the Dr. Phil show, that I wanted to use this platform to help open up the dialogue about mental health in America. And I think we're taking steps towards doing that. For more information on today's show, I want you to go to drphil.com. Everything you saw on the screen today, every list of warning signs, every step, every characteristic is all going to be there, as well as some strategies on what you can do. You can join our online community and talk to others going through the same thing again. The important thing is don't get isolated. Again, I want to put that hotline up for anyone feeling at risk for suicide. So there's the number. And listen, there is no shame in reaching out for help. So I urge you to make that call. Dr. Joyner, thank you so much. Uh, he's here from Florida State University. His book is called Why People Die by Suicide, and it is a very interesting and intriguing read, and it's very accessible. I mean, it's not a lot of psychobabble. It's very accessible, understandable characteristics.